So what is this old world exploration all about anyway? Well, let's take the Bavarian castle New Schwanstein here. They tell us that this thing was constructed in uh, 1869 and completed in 1886. They tell us King Ludwig II had architect Edward redraw the plans for this thing. Here on this channel, I'm asserting that the names and the dates are a fabrication to fit a timeline. A timeline that favors those who call themselves kings and queens and aristocrats. A timeline that maintains the hierarchy we have known our entire lives. You're welcome to take the blue pill and take the history channel at face value. But if you're brave enough to take the red pill and jump into the unknown with me, we'll find out how deep this rabbit hole really goes. Welcome to episode two. I thought we would begin this episode in Melbourne, Australia. I did do a video on Melbourne some time ago. But you can see it down here on the south coast of Australia, sort of disconnected from Tasmania. You, know, you have to wonder, maybe there was this was connected once upon a time, pre-cataclysm. Who knows? Let me take a look at Melbourne's population growth here. You can see um, quite a rapid rise, up to f half a million people. And then a flat line, this is when they had a... Um, depression, we are told. You can see taking off in modern day two and a half million people in Melbourne. And some spectacular architecture in this city, um, really not um, befitting of what we would think of as uh, uh, Australia in the 1800s. But again, when you come to come to see the narrative and uh, the truth of it for what it is, you start to realize that these structures were everywhere. So in this uh, um, portion of this episode, I want to look at two structures. So I thought we'd begin with the Princess Theater, a uh, structure that does still stand to this day. And you can see it in the modern day, um, still showing off much of its old world charm to us. And a little narrative for context here. We can see um, it's a f almost a 1500 seat theater, originally established in 1854. And this is a, a picture of what it looked like uh, before it was rebuilt. This is from, supposedly from 1865. They tell us it was rebuilt in 1886. And we have a gold rush narrative, um, very similar to um, North American narratives, like a mirror almost. You also have the trains um, converging on Melbourne in that same time period in the 1880s before the so-called depression. But they tell us here the uh, the new Princess Theatre, the one that we're focused on right now, by 1885 the old theatre came under the control of these three gentlemen, the Triumvirate, and uh, the existing theatre was so run down that they had to dis demolish it. And again, the new theatre, the one we're going to be looking at, was built and completed in 1886. So the old one demolished 85, new one 86. And we're going to keep that timeline in our in the back of our mind as we look through many of these um, pictures. And you can see it almost being covered up here in that early time period. Um, and looking like depictions of royalty here in the front, the king and queen, of course, the uh, colonial narrative. Strong in Australia, much like Canada. And now we can see some of the interior um, splendor of this structure. Uh, really ticking the boxes of a lot of the old world architecture. Remember, supposedly one year. And some of you might say, well, they did uh, renovate it several times, and that is true. So it's hard to tell what was there and what's been changed. But uh, a lot of what we're seeing looking very old world. Looking like it was most likely, likely coming out of the 1800s. 
even the infrastructure around it. You can tell the horse and buggy people, the streetcars, of course, it doesn't matter where the streetcars were invented, they seem to have spread across the realm in a, in a flurry. It's, it's really quite ridiculous, actually, to see all these cities um, with the same infrastructure. And we'll just look at a few more of the interior. And as you look up close, you can see the gold statues um, surviving down through time. So that's the Princess Theater. We'll take a look at one more building. So this one is known as the APA Building, um, Australian Building, Australian Property Investment Company Building, or API Building. Gets a little bit confusing. Um, construction time two years, 1888 to 1890. We're looking at 12 stories. Um, at the time, the tallest commercial building in Australia. Some some claims um, that it was the tallest in the world, competing with uh, cities like New York and Chicago. Uh, and the, those claims were backtracked down through time. This has been demolished. This thing was demolished in 1980, I believe. So the Australian Property Investment Company, supposedly the one that had this building constructed, decided to hold a limited competition in 1887. Uh, the winner of that competition won Henry Hardy Kemp. And although he died in 1946, this guy's basically a ghost. And the narrative tells us that construction begins in 1888 and completed sometime in the middle of 1890, so we're really looking at less than 20 months uh, for this thing to go up in the 1880s. Again, impossible, impossible part of the narrative as far as I'm concerned. And what do they do to this over time? Well, as it got toward the end of its life, they decapitated it, put this uh, ugly roof on, uh, no doubt to take um, the attention off of the structure and the magnificence of the architecture itself. Um, you would think that this architect, if they really wanted to celebrate um, the situation, this, this gentleman would be um, praised um, as a large part of the history of the region, but really this stuff gets swept under the rug. And you can see here, even in a before and after of that location, this is what it looks like in the modern day. This is what it looked like before or after they had taken off the uh, the tech on the top, you know, the ornamentation, whatever you want to call it. There it is in all its splendor. So that's just a little taste of Down Under for you, Melbourne. This is the Paterno Castle, located uh, along Riverside Drive in New York City. I should say that it no longer stands, but you can see the area that it once stood. You have Castle Village right here. And we are told that this was built in beginning in 1905 by one Charles V. Paterno. We are also told that this thing was demolished in 1938, a very short shelf life for this structure. Now we are told that the construction on this one was completed in 1916, which really only gives it a 22 year shelf life from the date of completion. We also have a curious uh, situation here where the uh, conical roof gets removed, supposedly sometimes in the late uh, 20s, early 30s, um, citing decay and rot, which, you know, 20 years, come on. I'll just read a little bit of Wikipedia for you. Although the building's facade was medieval, the interior design was not. Each room was decorated in a different style. Talk about extravagance. Louis XV for the parlor, colonial for the dining room, Asian for the library. Uh, the second floor gallery gets a, an organ, pipe organ, of course. So we're told all the room, bedrooms were located on the second floor. And on the third floor we get a banquet hall and ballroom. On the third floor, which is, seems a bit strange for uh, construction purposes. We have this retaining wall as well, a curious situation. Uh, they're saying this one gets constructed uh, 20 years after it is built. 1925 the date for that one. You also have a retaining wall down here below the road. 
very interesting, looking very, uh, very old. It's very strange that something like this would have been constructed in 1925 in New York City as a retaining wall from a highway. And apparently it did collapse in uh, 2005, partly collapsed, and it's been repaired. And you can see the old and the new right here, the difference between the two. So 1925, less than 100 years old, this wall here. And a little bit more about this structure. The basement had massage rooms, Turkish baths, a grill room, a lounge, a swimming pool, surrounded by bird cages. <laughs> Weird. Filled with filtered water from the river. And one cellar was dedicated to raising mushrooms, called the Mushroom Vault. Again, one of these strange stories of this building that takes 15 years to build and then they tear it down 22 years later. And all of this looking like very old medieval um, construction. You know, they're, they're building this in uh, New York in 1925. I was sure would love to have seen um, some photographs of the construction of this. Perhaps a video would be nice. And you can see on the plan here that uh, there was an underground entrance to the house as well. It's very mysterious. Um, there are stories of people playing in tunnels under this area long after it had been torn down. The tunnels still existing and the part of the retaining wall that collapsed apparently caved in the tunnels as well. So a little bit more of the story for you. It is interesting when you look at these uh, old photographs too, and I'm not sure when they'll say this was from, but you can see how old the retaining wall is looking here. And then you have this this uh, construction built on top of it. Pergola style of construction. And there's that very short time frame of, uh, of shelf life for this structure. This old castle looking structure from the New York area. The end of the Gilded Age, they're saying, so a bit of a spillover um, from all the Gilded Age, man Age mansions that were said to have been going up at the time. And we have this paternal castle. And I'll finish this segment off with a short video on the demolition of this structure. Who wants a beautiful castle? This one is going, and how far, you'll find out. Once the home of one wealthy American, Paterno Castle has to make way for many houses for the not-so-rich. In other words, an apartment block. So they decide to knock it down. I seem to have heard that across the Atlantic, bumping off isn't so new. A quarter of a ton slung against anybody's home would make a big impression. And this is no exception. The demolition goes on for days. Watched, I suppose, by quite a few neighbors, with evil designs upon a battlement or two, to build a rock garden or two, or maybe even three. So it's old stone, going cheap. You're looking at the current courthouse for Pierce County in Tacoma, Washington State. And you can see here Tacoma, not far from Seattle. But of course this is not the topic of this section of the video. The previous courthouse will be the topic of discussion for this section of the video. So this thing was built between 1890 and 1893. And I'll just read some of this uh, write-up from historylink.org about this courthouse. You can see it was demolished in 1959. So we're told the citizens of the county urged commissioners to build a new courthouse. Uh, and in 1890, the wheels are put in motion. So they put a contest out um, to build what they are hoping for, at least a three-story building with brick and stone facings and terracotta trimmings is what we're told. Three stories was what they were hoping for. Winner of the contest is Proctor and Dennis, architectural firm. And if we look them up, we see that they're responsible for a good handful of buildings, half of them which look like they've been demolished um, in that area of Washington State. And what the people of the county get is actually a four-story building with a 200-foot central clock tower and a basement to be used as a jail. And they say that this was modeled after the uh, Allegheny County Courthouse in Pittsburgh, 
which was designed by H.H. H. Richardson. And we are told the design includes a wood frame covered in brick and on top of the brick was supposed to be a stone facade. Uh, the roof was to have metallic shingles and a copper ridge. So the people of the county really must have uh, been okay with shelling out the cash to get this thing done. And it really is ridiculous reading all, everything that was included in this design, um, why they would choose such an extravagant design. And a lot of the, the uh, building here not even used. We have uh, the third floor having eight rooms without a purpose. And then you have the attic space, which we'll get into above that. And we're really ticking all the boxes here for the uh, short um, demolition uh, of these buildings. We have a two and a half year building time. It was supposed to only be two years. Apparently the contractor went over limit uh, and it never got paid for the extra time that it took to build this thing. Now we do have a construction photo, um, which I find highly suspicious. This is supposed to be from 1892. This is two years into the build um, with less than a year, really, depending on the time of year this was said to have been taken. And does this look like a construction photo to you? Does this look like a construction site? Um, you see all the rocks strewn about and you see these uh, curious looking gentlemen not, not too impressed with the situation. A, one of those classic construction photos. We don't really get any other photos from that time period, just a token construction photo. So according to the accounts, this thing was basically dilapidated the, the year after it was completed. The place starts falling apart, the boards, floorboards start warping, the roof starts leaking almost right away. Um, and we have some interesting conflicting accounts um, of the attic space. So we're told um, there really was no purpose for the attic space so early on. There were executions held in there at the turn of the century. But I found another account on TacomaHistory.live which tells us about there's another construction photo but it tells us about one of the wealthy gentlemen of the area Mr. Clinton P. Ferry having traveled to Europe and brought back with him all sorts of art pieces and they chose to use the attic space of the courthouse to display these art pieces. So that's directly contradicting the story we're being told of the um, executions being held in that space. We also get a story of a basketball team. Um, they call themselves the Skookum Athletic Club. Now they have a, actually a basketball court up there. Because of the high ceilings in the attic space, they're able to put a basketball court up there. And they stay in there until, um, in, until we get into the um, 1900s. So I don't know, unless they were hanging, the, uh, hanging the, the people they're executing from the backboard of the basketball court. I don't know really what's going on there. We also have an interesting account of the, um, the clock in the clock tower not going in until 1911. And a quick look at a bird's eye view map of Tacoma, Washington from 1893. And you can see the courthouse up here already completed. So I'm not sure when this is supposed to have been um, depicting. You can also see that there are other types of structures existing in Tacoma at the time. A city of just over 30,000 people, we are told, at that time period. So after multiple accounts of the continuing dilapidation of this structure, there's an earthquake that hits the area in 1949 and destabilizes the clock tower. Um, also in this article um, they, they mentioned that the earthquake was the um, the reason why so many of the um, ornate decorations were removed from so many of these old world structures. And that story fits with a lot of other things we've seen after uh, the post-World War II era and the modernization, the progressive brutalism that takes over. But here you can see um, this thing's been decapitated and, and until we get to 1959, which would be this year here, they begin to demolish the structure. And you can see the process, you can see they're, they're salvaging. And I think this photograph says that all the uh, demolishing of the old world and the new world with its boxy ugliness.